turning it over to you. Thanks very much indeed. And I, and I do apologize for the little delay. I suppose there is a, a bit of a physical distance between us, but there shouldn't be a technical distance between us, but never mind. Uh, these things happen, pass codes and entry systems and all of those bizarre realities. But I'm, I'm sorry I'm not physically there with you this week. Um, there still remains a US presidential ban on UK and European visitors. You can come to us, but you won't let us come to you. I don't know why you're so frightened of us. We're quite nice. We were once very kind to you, if you can remember that fact. But never mind. I'm stuck here for now, and I hope there will be some release um, I'm going to try and address a very, very difficult issue, and I'll be bang contemporary, and I hope, no matter how difficult the words I may say are, that you'll give me the scope to at least share these ideas with you, and then you can openly question and challenge as you feel appropriate. I was asked really to put something difficult on the table that we could then throw around as a subject of discussion, but also to address something that relates to um, how do we make people work better with us and how do we deal with difficult people? Now, a little bit of that might sound like a kind of talk from human resources. Um, no, I'm not interested in that. I want to go macro and then see what the lessons of macro might teach us. In 2006, um, one year after I had become a member of the British House of Lords, which is an appointment made by Her Majesty the Queen and, and is an appointment for life. So it's the equivalent of a US Senator, except that uh, we don't have to be elected. It's one of the joys of having a monarchy. Um, and I'd encourage you to continue to look at that thought in the United States. But leave that to one side. <laughs> I can see Cindy smiling at that thought. It might have caught your attention. But a year after I was appointed to the House of Lords, I took the opportunity with a group of fellow members of the Lords to visit the British West Point. Now, West Point is, for the United States, probably your premier army development center. And for us, it's called Sandhurst. I, I suppose, again, the difference between West Point and Sandhurst is that Sandhurst was there before the United States was the United States, and it remains as it is now, the premier training center for the British Army for its officers. It was an occasion that was very um, interesting for me because I was there to take a look at whether the British Army had taken on board the challenges laid down by the statutory body called the Commission for Racial Equality, and would the proportion of British black officers meet a target of 4.5%. Well, what we actually discovered on the day was that they'd exceeded the target by 4.7% and they'd exceeded it by one year. It, it would also be true just to say as a matter of interest that I had the opportunity while there to deliver a lecture on leadership to both Prince William and uh, of course, Prince Harry both of whom were training at Sandhurst. There were the two young men sitting at the front alongside the other trainee officers in the British Army system. Put that to one side. That's not what impressed me. What impressed me was taking a visual tour of the chapel, which is over 400 years old. And as I went around the chapel, the chaplain, who is a member of the army, was explaining to me the meaning of the different windows in the chapel. And he pointed out three windows that were dedicated to Afghanistan. Each one of the windows was a British military success. But the three windows dedicated to Afghanistan were British military failures. Now there'll be a fourth one. And I was so shocked by that experience in 2006, I've never forgotten it. It won't have escaped your attention. I'm sure you've seen something of the immense disorder in Kabul today. I've been watching it 
glued to various channels and reading so many outlets in the last few days. It's not going to be long now before we remember 20 years of 9-11. And for many of you, there may well be painful points in that remembrance. A lot of people lost their lives and the carnage was wicked. I remember the day very well. I was in Westminster in London. I wasn't a member of parliament at the time, but I was in an office in Westminster and we couldn't take our eyes off the screens. What was happening was truly evil. And you recall that 3000 people lost their lives on that day, of which around about half that number were US citizens and the others from international countries working in the Twin Towers. It took a few years before there was agreement primarily between the United States and the UK to take action against Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2006, I also, on my way back from Pakistan, I'd been in Islamabad, at the invitation, interestingly, of the World Islamic Economic Forum. And on the way back on the flight, we flew over Afghanistan. The mountains were so high that even at nearly 40,000 feet on an airplane, you felt as though the mountains were touching the jet engines. I, I remember looking out of the window and it, it seemed to go on for hours. And it probably was hours. I remember looking down out of the window thinking, no wonder nobody can win there. It's just pockets of cavernous mountains. And there seems to be no structure and no system. Well, the last few days have caught us all by horrendous surprise. In one way, let's not bother ourselves about who made bad decisions. Lots of books will be written in history about that. We can be sure of it. But let's bother ourselves about why we continue to see bad decisions being made about an area of the world and about an approach to that area of the world that causes us so much distress. The then US Secretary of State named the battle to come, enduring freedom. Well, it's not been either long enduring or freedom. 20 years, yes, is long enough, but freedom is not now established. 100,000 American troops have been present over the 20 years. 10,000 British troops have been present over the 20 years. Tragically, 2,448 American lives lost, 457 British lives lost. We were the two countries who held on to Afghanistan. Nearly $2 trillion spent and when you add up the Afghan lives lost from 66,000 Afghan national military and police killed, 47,000 civilians killed, 51,000 Taliban and other insurgents killed, that's a lot of life gone. These things are very painful, very painful indeed, and they're not easy. And all of us need to look with a careful eye at current events and be prepared to ask very awkward questions of ourselves and those around us. I remember when the Soviets left Afghanistan in 1989. That was then, well, 32 years ago, as a result of the collapse of Soviet presence because of the Mujahideen. The Soviets, who were close by, thought they could defeat them. 
They couldn't. The French had had a go, and the British had three times had a go, and now four. And of course, the United States rolled in the big guns in 2003. Nobody is one in Afghanistan. And as we've watched the rolling over of what we thought was the investment of billions and billions and billions that would surely shore up this thing we hold to be so precious that we call democracy. We thought that by spending large and being largely present, dominant in military authority, dominant in air power, we would create something that would liberate an enduring freedom. Not so. It was um, the great German philosopher, Hegel, who died in 1831, who made this comment. We learn from history that we do not learn from history. It really pains. How could we have arrived at this point when we thought we knew so very much? The defense leadership at the time was Donald Rumsfeld. My own brother worked for Donald Rumsfeld. He was chief scientist to the US Air Force. My brother is now MIT. He's professor of aerospace science at MIT. But at that time, he was working for the US government. He told me many funny stories about Donald Rumsfeld, but very challenging ones too. And as you know, he passed away recently. It was he who said these almost seemingly conflicting words. There are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That's to say there are things we know that we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know that we don't know. Maybe one of the things we don't know is whether we think that the great lesson of what we think has worked for us doesn't work for others. What we think of as democratic rule based on educated, informed, intelligent decision-making. Interesting, isn't it, that whenever analysis of elections takes place, either in the United States or certainly here in the UK and other countries, there's always a dividing line between those who are college educated and those who are not college educated. It always comes out in the data. It's a kind of assumption that what universities do, what schools do, what centers of learning do differentiates so powerfully, and some data would indicate that, that it defines how democracy works. One of Hegel's uh, great influences, there were so many, was Plato. And of course, ancient philosophers like Plato were, were talking writ large about subjects that we can battle our minds on for hours. But Plato said this, which was so influential to Hegel's thinking about the philosophy of government. Plato said, if you don't take an interest in the affairs of your government, then you're doomed to live under the rule of fools. I find that really challenging. If we don't take an interest in the affairs of our government, we're doomed to live under the rule of fools. For so many of us, the outcomes of incredibly complicated global events or national events are handed over to others. They must decide. 
we believe in a system and systems of appointing people with intelligence and authority to make decisions for us. There's some merit to that. But another great thinker, H.L. Mencken, who wrote around about 1940, an American journalist, essayist, who met, had many acerbic critics of American life and culture, let alone of British life and culture, said this, for every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. I've been reflecting on that in the last few days. There seemed to be simple solutions, didn't there, in response to 9-11. We just need to take the wrong people out who are the right people we need to take out because they're the wrong people. We kind of agreed together between the British government and the American government that what we need is the full force of our military and diplomatic and our authoritative and our massive spending power. What we could do is transform a corner of the world to look like we could modernize it. We haven't been able to do that. It's very easy, isn't it, to prescribe our way. We're certain our way. It's very hard to learn other people's way. It's hard to live enough, to believe enough, to get to the heart of why people think unlike us. Why they just don't respond the way we do to systems and answers which we think are just logical and straightforward. Why don't they get it? Well, choices were made in 2001 in response to the events in New York that we're still living with now. And when we ask the question, are these this weekend's events of relevance to us? The answer is very clear. It may be far away, but far away matters more now than ever before. We can't have security and certainty from either invisible forces like viruses that can find their way from unidentified places and sources we can't quantify. And they can trash the nature of how we live and make decisions for us. And the fight over the differentiation goes to the very heart of people's perspective about what's important. And if it's viruses that give us pain, tragedies like terrorism give us even more. So we live with these things. But do we learn from these things? In the last week of July, I took my first flight in a year. It's not been easy to go anywhere. Places I would have gone to, like coming to the US, banned. Uh, going to various parts of Europe, very difficult, depending on which borders were open, which were not, and frankly, anywhere else in the world was out of it. And there was even a period here in the United Kingdom where it was illegal to travel except for very limited reasons. This is all to do with keeping the virus out and keeping us safe. But I went to Munich and I was attending the opening day and next day of One Young World. Every year that's usually around about two and a half thousand uh, 22 year olds to 35 year olds gathered somewhere. It's been in many corners of the world from Bangkok in Thailand to Dublin in Ireland, of course, to London, where it began to Switzerland, to, to uh, uh, Canada in various cities and the United States. And I remember being in Phoenix, uh, where we had a One Young World gathering, 10 years of gathering young men and women, all of whom are world shapers. It's the sort of youth Davos of the world. 
Well, this time in Munich, it was the first conference on German soil in a year of any kind. And being held in Bavaria, the leadership of Bavaria were out in force. And they hosted us very, very, very well. There was a sumptuous dinner on the opening night. And I'm going to hold up a picture to the camera if you can see this incredibly sumptuous hall. This is the Munich residences. The antiquarium built between 1569 and 1571 under Duke Albrecht V of Bavaria, a museum for the Ducal Antique Collection, the oldest part of the residential palace that was still standing. It was designed in order to be a banqueting hall and the great joys of the 1600s were celebrated in that period. So much of German art, music, theater and thought were brought to the Munich residences but it was completely destroyed in 1944 and the central bays of the vault collapsed. But it was reconstructed in 1958 and now is in the gift of the Bavarian minister and president for festivities and receptions. And we were hosted in that phenomenal hall. It led me to ask a lot of questions of the German leadership who sat around me at the time, who wanted to explain the history of this great building, as to how come in this very city in 1921, that the Third Reich began its birth. This is the epicenter of great German philosophy and culture and writing and thought and drama and insight, such immense beauty, such great sculptures, such overwhelming art. It was an incredible experience to see it and to sit in it, to realize that every single bit of the hall that we sat in had been rebuilt to its original designation. And it looked phenomenal. How is it possible that such incredibly artistic, philosophical, thoughtful, literate, intelligent, captivating people could have voted democratically three times for the Third Reich? How come? How does it happen that what could then become probably the world's most catastrophic world event. The Second World War, of course, in some ways, fewer people died than in the first, but the nature of the determination of those deaths was far more focused. How did cultured people become so easily deceived? Well, if we love history, we we can take a lot of time to think about it. And when we think about it, it allows us the chance to ask ourselves the questions we normally avoid. And we all know that we avoid these things. We avoid them because it's, life is just too complicated to think too deeply. So I decided to do quite a lot of rereading of history for this talk to you today. I decided to plunge rather deeply into a lot of documents, books, texts, and analysis. There was a lot of it. And any attempt to summarize it is probably quite naive. But let me just pick on a few points. A minority of people, about 10 to 15% of Germans, liked the idea of the new emerging communism. The communism was birthed as a consequence of the end of the First World War. Communism promised the broken Germany a chance to have an alliance with the USSR. It was the prospect of some potential recovery. 
But communism was also deeply troubling and dangerous. The Nazis played into the fear of people. They spread stories about the dangers of Bolshevism and the threat that a red revolution might happen at home. And it worked. As the communists became more popular, the rest of the population turned far more right wing than they'd ever been before. Soon, the Nazis were sending out thugs on the streets to brawl with communists, to fight over thoughts and ideas. Hitler was just such a man, tough in his determination. And then one macro world event happened. October the 29th, 1929, the US stock market crashed. This was the beginning of the Great Depression and few places were, were harder hit as Germany was. What was left of the German economy was built on foreign money after the First World War. They earned their wealth through foreign trade and since 1924 had covered their costs through loans from the United States. When the Great Depression hit, those loans dried up and the Americans started calling in the outstanding debts. Germany was crippled. Industrial production dropped to 58% of its previous level. Unemployment skyrocketed and by the end of 1929, 1 1.5 million Germans were out of work. By 1933, that had risen to 6 million Germans were out of work. Hitler was thrilled. With the economy collapsing, the German people were starting to doubt that a democratic government could ever get things done. Never in my life, he said, have I been so well disposed and inwardly contented as in these days, for hard reality has opened the eyes of millions of Germans. Well, as we often say, the rest is history. The tragedy of those events, in some ways similar to the tragedy of Afghanistan, is that we often fail to take the time to understand the forces that drive people into fear. And then from fear, drive them to make irrational and dangerous long term disastrously consequential decisions. When people are fed fear and uncertainty, they reach hard for the little things they know to grab a place of certainty itself. And for all of us, when fed with fear and witnessing fear, we want somehow a response, that quick and easy way through. And the assertions of nations who have power, whether it was once us, or once you, or next to be, maybe China, nations that have power is to assert simple solutions to very complex problems that require people to hear one another. One of um, Germany's great thinkers wrote Between the Wars, Bertrand, Bertrand Brecht. I'm sure you've probably gone to a Brecht, a Brecht play at some point. Uh, they're not very entertaining, they're hard work. But he makes a very sincere challenge in probably one of his most potent of all quotes. When Brecht says, that the worst illiterate in the world is the political illiterate. They hear nothing, they see nothing. They take no part in political life. They don't seem to realize, he says, that the cost of living, the price of beans, of flour, of rent, of medicines, all depend on political decisions. 
the political illiterate even prides himself on his ignorance, he says. Sticks out his chest and says that he hates politics. He doesn't know, Rex says, the imbecile, that from his political non-participation comes the prostitute, the abandoned child, the robber, and worst of all, corrupt officials, those who submit to exploitative multinational companies and their deceitful actions. Brecht had a very important point. We all face a difficult decision in all of our lives. How much do we engage with these hugely complicated issues? How much do we disconnect and hand them over to others? When Professor Boyd and Boyd Craig and I were teaching our students in the semester just gone, we asked them all to read a book on speeches that had changed the world. We selected a number of speeches and challenged them to take time to read and to think about major speech thought. One of them was called The Perils of Indifference. It's a speech that was given in 1999 on the 12th of April at the White House. Uh, Bill Clinton was president at the time. It was a speech given by Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel's family was sent to Auschwitz in 1944, where he endured slave labor, starvation, and beating. He was then transferred to Birkenfeld's camp, where he was liberated by U.S. forces in April 1945. Afterwards in Paris, he attended the Sorbonne, taught Hebrew, ran a choir before becoming a journalist. He published his renowned Holocaust memoir, Night, in 1958. And he delivered the speech on indifference at the White House in front of a comprehensively mixed political audience. Senators, congressmen, leaders from every side, leaders in business, leaders in education, leaders that make decisions. He says that indifference is very tempting. It's even seductive. The temptation to live our lives without having to be involved. What is indifference? Well, he says, etymologically, the word means no difference, as though to us it makes no difference. But he goes on to add that indifference is implicitly not just no response, it is a response. Indifference is not a beginning, says Wiesel, it is an end. And therefore indifference is always the friend of the enemy, for it benefits the aggressor, never his victim whose pain is magnified when he or she feels forgotten. The political prisoner in his cell, the hungry child, the homeless refugee, not to respond to their plight, not to relieve their solitude by offering them a spark of hope is to exile them from human memory. And in denying their humanity, we betray our own. Indifference then, says Weasel, is not only a sin, it is a punishment. And this is one of the most important lessons of this outgoing century's wide ranging experiments in good and evil. He has some reflections on his time in Germany. He thinks about the outcomes of how did we all respond to those events? And he ends with this final challenge. Talking about the realities of the way we fought wars since the Second World War. This time he says we need to respond. This time we need to intervene. Does it mean that we've learned from the past? Does it mean that society has changed? Has the human become more? Have we become more or less indifferent and more human? Have we learned from these experiences? Are we less insensitive to the plight of victims of ethnic cleansing and other forms of injustice in places near and far? He's making the seasoned point that for most of us, our 
chosen lives allow us to be indifferent. So we allow easy solutions and governments love that. But the consequences of easy solutions is a lack of historical and deep thinking. We don't seek to bring people together to understand. We just seem to impose. And by the imposition of positions or solutions, we then drive fear more deeply. I'm going to wrap up in a few minutes and I want to leave some time for you to question or to challenge as you feel appropriate. I suppose what I've been trying to say in this is that we have to stare at our world as it is. And we have to regret. What the experience of Sandhurst taught me in 2006, as I will, I hope, make another visit to Sandhurst and see a fourth failed British attempt to win in Afghanistan. Something your country and my country sought to do together and we failed for all the lives given and lost on our side, on your side, on their side, for all the money spent. We can't answer things by big weaponry. We can't change our world by forcing itself upon us and us upon it. We can't mold it our way. It's not like us. Every attempt with the exception of Israel at democracy in the Middle East has failed. Every single one. All across the North of Africa, right across the countries of the Middle, it's failed. It works for us, it doesn't work for them. And even for us, it's frayed. The events of this year, for us, the events of the last few years. Now, I'm an optimist. I believe that amazing people produce compelling outcomes when given the opportunity to change the world radically for better. I was thrilled to learn about an amazing man called Karl von Dreis. I don't know if you've ever heard about him, but he was the German innovator who created the bicycle. Did you know that it was a major world crisis in 1815 as a result of an enormous volcano erupting in Indonesia that caused catastrophic world climate change of a different nature to the one we're experiencing now, which ultimately led to people in Europe not knowing whether they should feed their horses or feed their families. The result was they chose to feed their families and the horses died. So how were people going to transport things around from town to town and village to village? Well, Carl von Dreis came up with the two-wheeled instrument. We now call it the bicycle. From that catastrophic moment came an innovation. We all have that potential within us. I was reading, I love obituaries, and I, I wonder whether you've ever attempted to write your own, but I'm very tempted to write my own. And, I don't, would hate what other people would say about me, but I, I read obituaries all the time because I like to understand people's lives that have been fascinating. And one of the obituaries that popped up on May the 29th this year was an obituary about Huan Long Ping. Now I had heard of him before, but I couldn't quite remember why, but Huan Long Ping was the developer of hybrid rice. He died on May the 22nd, age 90. He was Chinese. He was the man who spent a long time trying to study and understand whether hybrid rice, in other words, chemically adjusting rice grown, could produce higher yields or lower yields. Well, the consequence of the higher yield outcome, up to 30%, uh, allowed the rescuing of 57 million people in the immediate experience in China who were starving to death and over 160 million people around the world benefited during his lifetime from the hybrid product he produced. He had the patience 
to literally sit it out in the rice fields and find a solution. Or oh, I read this other obituary on May the 22nd about a man called Aswa Yamuru. I'd never heard of him before, but it was an obituary in the Economist newspaper, so I treated it seriously. Teacher of Ethiopia's poor. He died on May the 8th, age 79. This was a man who was comprehensively illiterate, but chose to walk the long, long, long miles, in fact, over 60 miles, to get to the capital Addis Ababa, to appeal to the then government in order to find the resources necessary to not only to teach himself, but to set up schooling for others as a consequence of his long walk. Over 100,000 boys and girls were saved from the streets and destitution. Human beings can be remarkable. We really can be incredible. We can do stunningly fantastic things, but we can also do dreadful things. Short-term, short-tempered, short solutions. Our maturity means we can't live like that anymore. If the events of this weekend have startled us and they've certainly startled me if they've startled us then we have to ask how did we end up like this it's not about money there was no shortage of that it's not about weaponry there was no shortage of that it's not even about intention there was no shortage of that but there was no common purpose without a common purpose from the people on the ground to the people who go to the ground, we all head to the ground. On July the 17th last year, Congressman John Lewis died and he was buried on July the 30th. As you probably know, he left behind a letter that was to be read at his funeral. Nobody knew about this letter until the day he had died and he talks about the next great chapter in the American story. He says, use your power to make a difference in our society. Grab hold of this privilege that we all share. Treat it as something so beloved and vital that we're willing to contend for it. He called it make good trouble to ensure that the rights, privileges and freedoms we treat as so intrinsic to our life are maintained. And I want to read you just in closing some final thoughts from him. He said, you must also study and learn the lessons of history because history has been involved in this soul wrenching existential struggle for a very long time. People on every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. The truth does not change. And that is why the answers worked out long ago can help you find solutions to the challenges of our time. Continue to build union between movements stretching across the globe because we must put away our willingness to profit from the exploitation of others. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I've done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence is the most excellent way. Now it's your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens, to write the story of the 21st century. Let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last, and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. And so I say to you, walk with the wind. Brothers and sisters, let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love 
be your guide. And a final quote from Gandhi, because I don't know if you noticed in all the hullabaloo of this last weekend, it was India's 75th Independence Day anniversary. That's a shining democracy. It's worked, but it's been tough. And on Independence Day, the Indian government put out this reminder from Gandhi himself, who knew what it was to walk thousands of miles to show a better way to bring communities together. He said, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever. Our privilege, mine with you, what we do at Utah, what we do at the Huntsman School, what we do in the Stephen Covey Institute, what we do in the university, is to help our students learn as though they're going to live forever. And I hope they and we learn that one of the things we most vitally need are never simple solutions. Thank you.